consonants. All right, any comments, questions? I have one. You, the RFP's out. Have you, do you have any sense on how many people might be bidding it? Um, right now we've had, we've had three firms walk through. Actually, Wool didn't walk through because they've already been here. Um, I sent it out to 17 different firms, plus put it on public purchase. Uh, of those, uh, two were not submitting because of their workload. Um, and on that list is uh, not only just architects, but also um, companies that deal with just mechanicals. So we should get a good um, range for the project. Thanks. All right, we're looking for a presentation regarding redistricting and fair maps. And we've been, we'll allow five minutes for a presentation and then we'll a session for um, questions, but no more than that. I'm trying. doing the presentation? I think this is there. I'm Kim Garrett. I'm a long-standing resident of Alden Township. You were here with the Polk County voters concerned about gerrymandering. What's your name again? Kim Garrett. G-E-A-R-I-N. And you live in Polk County? I do. I live in Alden Township. Okay. And have for many, many years raised my family there. Sure. And are you with an organization or are you just here as an individual? I'm here with a number of people who, in the county that are working on nonpartisan redistricting as an important issue for the right. county and Wisconsin. I'm not here on behalf of an organization. Okay, so you're just here as an individual. I am. It's okay. vacation time. Sure. Okay. All right, the floor is yours. So thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. My co-presenter, Lisa Erickson, is unable to join me. But uh, we really believe strongly in this issue. We represent different sides of the aisle and have remained close friends despite many uh, political differences. But now more than ever, we think that we have to work together to find bipartisan ways to improve our life here in Polk County and Wisconsin. And ending gerrymandering is an area where we can really need to work together. We're post personally motivated by this issue because of the strength of our convictions. We want a government that works. Elected officials working hard for every vote, listening and representing the range of views in this county and counties across the state with integrity and accountability. But in addition to Lisa not being here today, as I said, I'm not here alone. I'm here on behalf of a group, oh, I'm sorry, the next slide, please, uh, of an active group of concerned Polk County residents, part of a bipartisan movement sweeping Wisconsin and the U.S. to achieve voting districts that are independent of politics. Next slide. Every 10 years, the year after the census, the Wisconsin State Legislature draws voting districts for the U.S. Congress and State Legislature. State Constitution requires districts to be contiguous compact, and follow county, precinct, and town boundaries where possible. Next slide. Things don't usually go well. In 1981, 1991, and 2001, due to gridlock and lack of cooperation on both sides, federal judges ended up drawing voting maps for Wisconsin. In 2009, Democrats controlled the legislature. They considered but did not pass bipartisan redistricting. In 2011, Republicans gained control of the legislature and governorship and drew the maps in their favor, just as Republicans that year did in North Carolina and Democrats did in states like Maryland and Illinois. Neither party has been above using redistricting to their advantage. Next slide. The red areas are congressional districts in place in different states. Some benefit Democrats and some benefit Republicans. Crazy shapes like this that don't follow county or municipal boundaries are usually a good sign that the district was drawn to advantage one party over another. 
a bipartisan, a, a partisan approach behind these oddly shaped districts, for example, is to put your opponents in their own safe seats by cramming as many of them as possible into a small number of districts and then spreading your own supporters over a large number of districts, diluting the vote of your opponents and increasing the party, the odds that your party will win even more. Next slide, please. We can do better. About 40 years ago, Iowa took a new route. Iowa took the politics and the politicians out of the process. The legislature delegated redistricting to an independent agency that holds public hearings and draws maps along existing county and municipal boundaries as much as possible without regard to voting history of jurisdictions or the residents of current elected officials. This slide shows the current, next slide please, Senate districts in Wisconsin. Polk County is divided into two Senate districts representing, spanning 14 counties. District 10 in purple and District Yellow in 25. Next slide, please. Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau, which is an independent bipartisan agency, adopted districting criteria used in Iowa as a test to see how that approach could work here in Wisconsin to create districts of equal population. Using that approach, all of Polk County is in a single Senate district, along with more immediate neighbors, Burnett, St. Croix, and Pierce, shown here in uh, hypothetical District 10. Please be clear, I'm not advocating for this map. I'm illustrating that there are straightforward, non-political approaches used elsewhere that we can consider here. Next slide, please. Otherwise, with partisan maps drafted to consistently benefit some over others, we all lose. Sprawling districts create distance and cause confusion. Safe districts are less competitive and incumbents less accountable to voters. And legislative gridlock on redistricting costs taxpayers money and time away from other important issues. Your meeting packet on page six, next slide please, lists the 54 counties that have passed a resolution in support of nonpartisan redistricting and the 28 counties that have gone further to pass a referendum. A quick scan shows that the referendums are passing all around the state with a large margin. Collectively, these jurisdictions represent more than 80% of the Wisconsin population. Next slide. In 2016, a federal court declared Wisconsin's current voting districts unconstitutional. In 2017, the state was ordered to redraw the maps. After more legal challenges, the Supreme Court ruled that the state, not a federal court, has to decide on our electoral maps. An advisory referendum, like the one in your meeting packet, is an opportunity for Polk County residents to have a voice on this critical issue. We ask that you allocate time during the January 19th County Board meeting to consider this issue and adopt a resolution placing a non-binding referendum on nonpartisan redistricting on the April 21 ballot. Thank you so much for your time. Anybody have any comments, questions? We'll have a good four minutes. Wow. Go ahead. I just have a comment, um, <clears throat> kind of looking at this issue. I was really surprised that Polk County hadn't already addressed this in some manner, given you know 54 other counties have addressed it. So um, you know, I think that it it's time that we take a look at this. Um, I would like to have <clears throat> have this placed on the ballot for, like to see it go to a referendum so our citizens have a chance um, to make their views known about it. Anyone else have a comment or question? It, you know, and you know, I completely support, you know, fair mapping and you know, I'm totally on board with the concept of fair mapping. Um, and it just gives me an opportunity to kind of ask a couple questions because, you know, we talked about this a few years ago. And is the fair mapping, does it break down to even a county then? Like, how a county, and I know you're not an expert at this, you know, you're not from the state, you're not representing anything. So I don't know if you're the right resource to ask, 
but I would certainly think to keep this on our work plan to talk about it in the future. Um, you know, does, does it? Does anyone know in this room that does this break down into county, like how we redistrict, how we have our own districts in our county? I can kind of answer that. <coughs> um, the county clerk's office, since the staff there is new, um, I know Carol Wondra had worked uh, last time this happened ten years ago, just after the last census. So um, we've been provided training and information. Um, last year's elections we are sure. still working on getting that information all squared away but that's stuff we are working on and, and we able to timeline on we work with um uh brad Frenberg, i think from the gis mapping to to do the county part of it um again don't have all the details but we're so it's coming yeah it's coming we're gonna have stuff fran yeah it, it's my understanding okay that county within the county the county supervisor redistricting that's a cooperative effort between the municipalities and the county. And this is a separate issue. This separate, is, okay. This has to do with, with state, congressional, and senate districts, and not with the local uh, jurisdiction uh, county. If, if it's, and I just don't know, <laughs> we'll design the districts if it's not done the way it currently What's the proposal of who would design? So um, right now, a lot of the work is around, certainly the work that I'm involved in, is just suggesting that there's a, there are other ways to do this. Um, a lot of times, good governance groups point to the approach used, for example, in Iowa, where the legislature delegated uh, um, sort of a, a nonpartisan agency within Iowa to develop possible? the is maps. That, is that possible? <laughs> But they've been doing it for 40 years. Not a lot partisan. of other states do something similar. Sure. So the suggestion in Wisconsin is that the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau could be that entity. That's the entity. It's a state agency, as I understand it, comprised of attorneys that routinely provide input for legislators, do research on behalf of the legislature, and so forth. It's bipartisan. So there are lots of models in other states. I'm not advocating any particular approach, just suggesting that we look again at the way we currently draw our maps. So who drafted the resolution? Who's, whose resolution is that we know someone's gone through this and again, it sounds like and here's the challenges we always have. We get a resolution thrown at us. It sounds like we do we have time that we could have this on in another agenda, bring someone else in to talk about it, or are we under a time frame again? I mean, Mike Pritchard always complains about that too. We get something thrown at us, and I don't know if Mike's on the phone. Is Mike attending the meeting? I haven't been able to find him. I may double okay. check and see. And Mike and I seem to always be that voice that we always say, you get something thrown at us, we have no time to call constituents, call legislators understand a resolution like this do we have time or are we under a timeline um, when we were our office was approached with the topic um it was regarding since it's a referendum they're proposing a referendum be added to the ballot there are deadlines if you wanted to add that to the april ballot which i believe is january 26th we need the information in our office to develop that referendum um, for the april ballot which is um, as far as part of that, the resolution did come in a template. Um, if you look at the list of the other counties that have developed um, resolutions in order to do a referendum or just um, lobbying resolutions, sure. um, that template came from um, kind of a just an overall template and then um, pulled from, I think I looked at 12 of the ones off the list and it was pretty standard across the board from the other Wisconsin counties. Who kind of revised it and edited it a little bit? I think it's worth noting that the binding is the, the resolution is completely non-binding. There's no real expense. It's really just an opportunity for the voters in Polk County to weigh in on this issue. All right. We're gonna say this portion is over and we'll move on to the discussion and possible action regarding we have two. Two resolutions. Yeah, I, I do want to check and see if Mr. Pritchard is on. All right. Mr. Pritchard, are you on the telephone? I am on the telephone. Okay. Yeah. 
on the telephone and I'm trying to log in, uh, but I'm not on the video. <clears throat> okay. And if, if it's appropriate, I would move the approval of resolution 121. Are, are these so separate that we need to talk about them separately? Or, I mean, what we're really doing is moving them to the county board, where we are not getting into no full-blown debate here on them. And I can address that as well, um, just because they had two, uh, when I had um, talked to Malia and Vince about it, there were two options. Some <coughs> counties had opted to do um, a referendum on the ballot for that information along. The other counties um, on a separate list had done a um, lobbying resolution just to encourage the state. We didn't know if um, you would be interested in one or the other or both. Some have done both, so both were presented um, with more of a lobbying resolution to the state. The other one's about adding the referendum to the April ballot. Well, I think we'd let the full county board decide right, which one. So I think we would just send them both, let the board make their decision, and you move on to the county board. I, I second that if there wasn't a second move into the county board. Yeah, I would just I, I, I would make a motion to send both resolutions to the county board. Okay. All right, well on our agenda. Mike, Mike you okay with that? Because you, you only moved on one, but we're gonna send just a motion to send them both to the county board. I'm fine, yes. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Areas. All right, we're um, looking for a <clears throat> discussion on a possible development of a county ethics policy for appointed officials. Who is who is leading that discussion? I can start. Um, we have a, an ethics policy for county board members. And we have an ethics policy for employees. So to me, it makes sense that we would also have an ethics policy for our appointed officials to be uniform and consistent amongst our policies of people who represent Oak County. Um, I would uh, propose that as of uh, consistent with page 14 of our rules of order, uh, that under Article 10, that we would adopt for appointed officials the same things, uh, standards that we are held to as county board members. And how would you define appointed officials? Are you talking like uh, appointed officials that are also county employees? Is that? Well, there is an employee policy that recently went into place, correct? So, That's correct. Yeah. Is that a point of order? Yeah. Uh, so this is general government. We're talking about this is for financing, and we had a big broad discussion executive committee earlier today. I would make a recommendation that this issue get sent to the executive committee's agenda. It doesn't seem like this is the right committee to be developing uh, policy and that ethics. ethics. Yeah, and I, I mean I think it's a good point. But I think these issues should be put in the correct committee. Would the chair be able to just rule on that, or is that how would that does it require a motion to move it to executive? I think you can just decide to because this is an executive. Executive is the one where the whole committee would act as the referring agent. But the topic was brought up here. It does seem appropriate for the ethics committee to deal with a question about an ethics policy for appointed officials. Exactly. Right. All right, we're going to move it there then. Well, okay. to the discussion regarding consideration of possible development of a county ethics policy for appointed officials will be on the executive. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, are we having any discussion now or not? No, no. We're, we're saying that it's kind of, I mean, it just came to our attention. We, we feel this is not the appropriate committee to even be discussing it. So it, it's just being moved to executive. 
I, I just I, I wanted to make just a couple of observations. I tried to see on our Polk County website if there was an employee handbook or a code of conduct or a code of ethics for the employees. Nothing came up on the website for that. I didn't call anyone, but it would be interesting if that's available that we would uh, know what that is and what it does contain. Uh, I'm thinking ahead if it gets to the board of uh, the board itself. And the, the other, the National Association of Counties does have a handbook on uh, 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 codes of uh, ethics, and uh, I think that would be a useful thing for the executive committee to look at if if they thought uh, that they were going to be. Uh, considering this, uh, and I did have a couple of examples, uh, online examples of uh, such things, and uh, I just mentioned that, and uh, I, uh, I had a call into the Wisconsin County of Associate, uh, uh, County, Wisconsin Counties Association, and they were going to get back to me if they had anything. I didn't find it on their website. All right, good. Those, just those comments, and I wanted to pass them along. I think right. it's a good idea to have one. We're looking for a recycling center discussion and possible action on a resolution. Resolution. Well, yeah, Mr. Chair, I think last time we had a discussion on a resolution that was brought forward by Mr. Nelson. I think Mr. Nelson kind of withdrew that. He kind, However, of, he kind of really re withdrew it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not kind of. I wasn't clear on that. Yeah. Supervisor okay. Nelson is no longer sponsoring a resolution to do anything with the uh, recycling right. center. So what I, would, what I have suggested and directed staff to do is, because we still have a recycling uh, challenge and opportunity and issue and our goal is to improve our recycling program and so we can't wait on this we are spending money and we have things to do so I just want to inform this group that we have uh, asked Foth engineering who probably knows our engineer our recycling program better than any outside entity and they have done consulting for recycling programs throughout the state of Wisconsin and elsewhere. We've asked them to take a deeper look and looking at two options. One, how do we, well, first, how do we improve our recycling program under two scenarios? And that is one, without the recycling <coughs> center, and two, with the recycling center. And to look at what are the costs, the ramifications, to not only our citizens, to the county, but to the villages and cities and, and uh, townships, uh, and, and what our, our, two, our primary options are and how, what's the best way to do it. The end result will be we'll come with an objective perspective on what we have, how it can be improved, or how we can change it to make it better, and then we can make a decision. So this resolution 421 is re not replacing because the other one was just withdrawn. Drawn. So this is kind of what we're going to take action on is moving this forward. That is the same one as before. I just remembered it from last year. I didn't have. So who's who's sending it? Where's it coming from? It was just from? a draft of the one that was last year. That was not, it was a, just a draft, and I, it was renumbered for 2021 since I didn't have it noted at. As withdrawn, so I, I can mark it as withdrawn now. Well, right. well, there, is the no oh, there, there is no resolution. There is no resolution. They just wanted a copy of it. But despite that, we have to continue investigating this. So that's why we're going to get this outside group to, to do a little more work for us, and then we'll be presenting back to you when we have that information. All right. So who's keeping? Go ahead, Brian. I, I'm just wondering who's keeping recycling center on as a discussion item if we have no resolution. Why? Why are we talking about it? To because at the last meeting, I think it was the chairman who said we're keeping it on the agenda. And well, I didn't know that a, the resolution was withdrawn at that time. 
Right. Yeah, but, but, there, if we have, but if we have more resolution, who on this committee wants to keep talking about it? Anyone? I don't. And you want to keep talking about it? I have a question. Um, maybe a better time to talk about it would be after we have these findings from the engineering firm. Sure. I just did want to make one statement that um, Mo was and uh, Nick were kind enough to give me a tour of the recycling center. And if you haven't already been there, you know, I would encourage everybody to take one if you haven't been there. And I just want to compliment Mo and Nick and the staff at the Recycling Center uh, for the outstanding job that they do, especially given, you know, what they have to work with. I think that they do a great job. All right. So, again, why? <coughs> let's get to why are we keeping recycling on our agenda? We have no resolution. Is like, what? What are we doing a study for? Because we we have an expensive operation, and the question is, we're going to have to invest in the recycling center in a significant way going forward. Okay, so, so, so we're, we're saying, saying, let's find the best approach. <coughs> so we don't have to discuss it here. We're going to do that, and when I have that information, I'll probably ask you to put it on the agenda. All right, so for now, the resolution, there is no resolution going. All right, we got anything going regarding the lime quarry, the pits? Yes. Okay, we'll have a discussion on possible action. I'd like to go into closed session to discuss the, the offer and the conditions. All right. What, before we do that, do we have anything we can do in open session? Because it seems like once we go into close and then try to come out, kind of anyone's following or we seem to kind of lose our meeting. So um, I don't, there's, is there any reason we can't? I think I can open items. I, I, I could give the presentation of the, uh, of the situation. There's one portion that because of negotiating, we can't bring up and, and we can, I have something for you that we can do in closed session later. So I can't show, I mean, I have no problem presenting most of this in open session. And I, I'm not even so concerned about the Lion Corps. If we need to go into close for the bids, I'm concerned on the rest of our agenda. Do we have items that, I don't want to go into close, lose our meeting and then try to go back into open and. I mean, they'll never know when we pick it up again. So let's do all of our open session items. And then once we go into closed, we come out, make an announcement of what happened, and adjourn. So what, what else is on here? Something, we do anything with the jail food and laundry service contract? Yeah, I can, I can inform the committee on that. Just We're just getting back to policy that says that any RFP above $75,000, we have to inform the general government committee on when we've selected a vendor. Um, the jail, a few years ago, combined laundry service and food service to an outside contractor. That contractor has been Summit Food Services. It runs on a two-year contract. Uh, the sheriff's office rebid it in September. We only had two companies bid on it. Summit was one of those companies. In comparison on the um, contracts, uh, the sheriff has selected Summit as his preference. Uh, I looked at the RFPs. They're in line with what we were paying before for the service. They have a standard 3% increase each year in the contract, which is kind of, you know, cost of goods, standard increase. It meets the sheriff's expectations and all, but the value of the contract is about $270,000 a year, and that covers the jail, all food service, all laundry service. So really, it's an informational thing to update you guys on the finance end of it. Uh, the sheriff and I went through it. We are looking at some savings down the road in hopes with this. And if, As our programs grow in the jail with CJCC and our program service officer and all, maybe using trustees in the jail to do laundry and maybe even at one point using inmate trustees on a work program to help with food, like a lot of jails do, to start driving those costs down. 
But right now, that's still a segment of the sheriff's budget that's contracted. Um, I just, it's one of those things I need to inform you of because it's, it's a budget expenditure, but it is an RFP over $75,000 that I need to update you on. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Is this a one-year contract or a multi-year contract? It's a two-year contract. Two-year contract, and then it's per year. It is. And then what would the procedure be? Uh, is, is the contract automatically renewable or have any provisions like that? No, we require we require a rebid on that. And one of the big reasons we do that is the cost of food fluctuates so much. Uh, we don't want to get locked in and have a better opportunity. And there's always vendors exiting and re-entering the market that may be interested in it. The other thing is, as we look at those business models, like I said, if we can ever get trustees in place to help, we wouldn't want to have our business model restricted by a self-renewing contract. Do they charge people to be in jail? They don't charge people to be in jail. We do have a booking fee, and uh, we can recoup. Um, like medical costs and stuff like that. I thought they had to pay so much a day to be in there. So maybe that's not true. No, um, we, we, have, we have a booking fee that sometimes we're able to recoup. We use tax intercepts and other methods when people don't pay their bills, um, medical fees, that kind of stuff. I think on average our meals run, this is very ballpark, I'm trying to test my memory here. I think a buck 70 in that range for breakfast, I think about two and a half for lunch and about three ten for dinner. I think snacks are around two dollars per day, I think is what it is per night. And laundry we pay by the pound. The diet plan I should be on the supervisor or can well I will remind everybody that the public safety committee does a tour and eats the food every year, so you're always welcome to come to that one. All right. Um, again, we're going to finalize our 2021 work plan. So, is there something we need to additional we need to get on there that we don't have on? Uh, the only thing I'll look at the meth topic because it will affect DG, and I'll figure out how to break it up on the committees, and I'll make a recommendation. The administrator our work plan is uh, we talked about an executive that uh, we would keep uh, the meth epidemic on our work plans until we get through it. Kind of the same as the COVID, get an update on the cost, and right? Whether we're getting re any reimbursement or yeah. we're just paying. All right, anything else we can do in open session besides adjourning? Because it looks like, are we going into close for a couple of different things? Yes, and I would ask that the topic that Mr. Loso is on be addressed first closed session he has court at 11 30. all right so what can you lead us in what we're going into closed session on mr oh, let me check one mr pritchard i've made you a panelist can you hear me via computer now uh can you hear me this way because i'm going to have to knock you off by phone i've got you on via computer as a panelist you'll be able to be in the close this way can, can can I participate by telephone then? No, sir. You're going to have to participate through the computer through this method. I have to do what? Through the computer. The way you're talking to me now, through the computer is how you'll have to participate. Can I, do I get admitted into the meeting then? Yeah, through the computer you do, but not the phone then. Yes, sir. I've got you in the meeting as a panelist through the computer. Okay. Okay. I'll hang up. All right, someone needs to get us in the closed session. I don't know if they're all under 19851E. One's under 1G. Two of them are under 19.851E. One is 19.851G. Under Wisconsin Statute 1985 1 or 1 to discuss the article regarding the Let me continue in closed session under 1985 1 to regarding county property near 1319 20 Road C. And that we from there we continue into 
to close session under Section 1985 per 130G regarding legal advice and litigation, referencing Polk County case number 20CV17. I was going to say you better hurry up because we already got the door shut. Uh, <laughs> with, with the exception of Corporation Council and Mr. President, I'm going to inject all attendees from the meeting at this time. Let's um, put it to a vote and see if we're actually going there. Chris? Here and there. We're going into closed session first. So the line quarry for property. So my question. I guess litigation, but why do we have to go into closed session about the line quarry? We have bids out there. Why can't that be done in open session? It's already public. It's a public. There, there's a portion of it that can be in open session. There's a portion that the administrator and I have discussed, and that portion needs to be in closed session. So we'll just address the closed session part of that and go back into open session if, if you're going to take any action on it. Um, could we... Could we and stay in open session and talk about the line quarry then? The, the chairman said he didn't want to talk about anything after we come out of closed session. We may be open some doors if we're not in closed session. I think we decide whether, I don't even know why are we going into closed session sure. specifically. Under under number 19, however, I would ask that you go under, into closed session relatively soon so that Mr. Loso can then go to court, be in court at 1130. But the other, However, procedurally, if you want to go into them one at a time. All right, let's do that. Let's just go into closed session, confirm with legal counsel and obtain legal advice on litigation that we're currently involved in. 19.851G. We get that motion and then we'll come out and then appreciate sure that, Chair. Yeah, I'll second that. All right. Are we supposed to have a roll call vote for going yes. in? Yes. 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 Mike, yes or no? Going to close? Bob, I, I didn't hear what we're voting on. We're, we're going into closed session only to confer with legal counsel at this time. Oh, okay. I, I, okay. All right. So we're in closed session. All right. Give me a second to close the doors. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to have everybody that's in the room will be voted in the closed session. Go ahead. Do you got something for us? Yeah, so um, this is Joe Loso. Um, we are a defendant in a civil action on a property in Polk County. Uh, the reason that we're the defendant or one of the defendants in the action is because um, we have a property where the owner is a number of years delinquent on their uh, taxes. Um, the property also has a mortgage and a second mortgage on it. And so the second mortgagee had filed the action to uh, foreclose on the property. The first mortgagee uh, wants all of the parties to sign a stipulation as to who has priority. Now, we as the county have a tax lien in the amount of at this point approximately eighteen thousand um, dollars the property owner did make a payment they paid off their 2017 taxes uh, about a week and a half ago so they are slowly uh, trying to catch up on their taxes but they are, like I said, still delinquent on 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, statutorily, we have priority. Um, we are supposed to get paid first if there is any forced sale of that property. The bank, which is the first mortgage holder, wants all of the parties to sign a stipulation saying that they have priority over all other liens. 
Um, like I said, statutorily, we have priority. Um, and so they have provided a stipulation to the county and I wanted a direction from um, the administrator and this uh, committee on <coughs> what the board would potentially want us to do, whether we actually stipulate to um, the bank having priority and us fall in line immediately below them, or uh, whether we uh, try to argue to hold our position as first priority lien holder. So that's the question. If we have first priority, why would we even argue about it? If we have it. Yeah, that would be my sacrifice statutory. I agree. I would say, I would say, Joe, you would do what we have statutory authority to yeah, do and not move, sign anything. Move forward that we have first rights. All right. Sounds good to me. It's easy. Uh, I believe that is all on that issue. All right. Thank you. I'll respond to the opposing attorney and let her know that that is the board's position or the committee's position. So we're not waiving our right, is that correct? That is correct. All right. I agree. But, uh, my win consensus with four of us here, so I guess you would make five. So. All right, um, motion to go back into closed or open session would be in order. I make that motion. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Back in open section. Do we have something on the line for you that we can discuss in open session? Yeah. If we do, we'll do that. Yeah, we can, uh, we can show you the vast majority of what I did. Put <laughs> everybody back on. They have a new one back on. You can if they like. You can? Yeah, it's open if they want to. You can have that presentation. Well, I gave you. No, no, no. My oh, on the flash drive. Yeah. Uh, and which one is it? And this is a five minute presentation. Or? Okay, uh, first of all, June 2020 is when uh, this committee and uh, the county board agreed to put up a line for a for sale for that an RFP. I will say this, since then we've had feedback and comments from a variety of people which have all gone into a lot of research that we looked at to make sure we're doing the right thing. So why did we uh, put the RFP up for sale, or they uh, put the RFP out there to sale at Quarry? One, it's operating at a loss. It's costing taxpayers. Two, every bit of agriculture line we sell, which is the purpose that we wanted, we've had this for so long and used it, is because we sell it at a loss. So we sell it $10, $11, and it's uh, per ton, it's actually three to four dollars more expensive every time you sell it. Uh, future necessary expenses are going to be significant. Things will have to be done. And equipment, for example, we have planned, you know, up to three hundred fifty thousand dollars in equipment purchase, and that doesn't include the pressure, which is almost non-functional. Um, building upgrades of eighty thousand, custom crushing. Uh, this year we have budgeted $580,000 to do. So that's a lot of money right there. The other thing too is the customers, our county employees, the people who go by that ag line, their needs and preferences are not being completely satisfied. We recognize that. And so we thought, what is the option? And one of them is to sell. <laughs> you saw a version of this slide earlier, and that is the sale. Uh, of our products from there. And you can see from 2016 up to 2020, we had the story in June of saying declining sales across the board really were happening. 220, we saw a rebound. 
and especially that rebound came in ag line. The unfortunate part again, remember, every ton of ag line we sell, we lose money. Um, total dollar losses from 2016 at $170,000 loss, $40,000 and $118,000 loss, $18,000, $147,000, 19 and again, with the biggest year we've ever had, or at least in recent history, a loss of 211000 because of the expenses that's going to go into it. Next slide. So the benefits of selling the quarry, I kind of touched on these. In June, <coughs> the farmers win by it. And again, through the input and everything, we are going to make sure that the ag line will be available per a uh, conditional use permit. And this is something that our attorney, Malia, did a great job of researching. By having that conditional use permit in there, they can sell, they have to have ag line available. If they do not, their permit to mine gets pulled. So that the farmer who goes there and says, hey, they haven't had egg line for a certain amount of time, I need it. Uh, that's part of the condition and the buyer understands that. His plan is to have egg line available. And if not, he's just spent a whole lot of money, time and effort for a hole. So he is going to have egg line available. Uh, pricing is going to be more competitive. That's in his business plan. If you recall, we showed the price that we charge versus what mines or quarries around here sell. They sell it for significant less. Our expectation is the price will come down. Better, more flexible customer service. The business plan of this individual is to open it up more days, better hours, and they have the flexibility to adjust when they have their people come into work. The county wins, we get a big influx of cash. Property taxes collected every year on that property versus now we don't. The cost of reclamation will be transferred to the new owner. Taxpayers win because they're no longer subsidizing an operation, the operation losses and county resources from this sale and that we are currently spending out there and people we are using there can reapply to other priorities. We had three bids. One was significantly better than the others for a lot of reasons. Jeff Anchak <coughs> and Anchak and Anchak organization about 1.3 billion dollars in land equipment and inventory. Business plan fundamentals that he stressed in the application or the purchase agreement. I mentioned a little bit increasing hours of operation. Delivery service, what we don't have now, two full-time and then, he, then stretching it at a later point to two to four part-time employees. Plan is to increase production levels and to decrease price. And then, again, he has reaffirmed on numerous occasions every time we've gone to him with uh, a proposal, how can we ensure you're going to have ag line? He's been very open to say, whatever you want, I'll do it. And now with the CUP, we think that is the, the best way to ensure that happens. A little background information, this company is involved in trucking, aggregate, and crushing for 20 years. Okay. The outcome of the sale for the taxpayer, for the county, 1.3 million gain for the sale. We will save immediately $580,000 in what we would a Kramer to crush. We're estimating about $20,000 in annual property tax. Other savings, as I mentioned, equipment that we would have to spend for, building upgrades, custom crushing, it adds up. Those resources could be applied elsewhere. Uh, the CUP ensures an ag line for the life of the court. The, uh, the other key thing that I would say is by doing this, we are relieved of the responsibility of reclaiming all that land. And, and that is a significant cost. I have an estimate that still have to be later. So it's still a win-win-win for farmers, taxpayers, and the county. Many of you or some people have brought forward, hey, wait a minute, shouldn't we look at other options like leasing? 
And I did. So we looked at the benefits of selling, and I just put a direct comparison here. There are things to consider. We saw the benefits of what we did if we sell it for it. If we lease it, we get no gain from a sale of 1.3 million. The lease amount, we're limited on what that lease would be. Technically, it would have to be a non profit lease. Could there be long royalties? There could be royalties, possibly, but you're kind of limited. How high are you going to make those royalties uh, so that someone will want to lease it? No property tax of the county. Uh, the liability and upkeep of facilities and equipment remains to us. Uh, also, all the land out there that has been dug already or mined would have to be reclaimed by us. And that would be a significant amount of money. Uh, Long-term ag availability is threatening. Uh, think about this. If someone leases, it's like renting a, a house or an apartment. You hope you got a good one. But at some point, somebody's going to bail on you. They're going to leave. They may, they may have a, an illness or a death. Or their lease simply is up. When that happens, if we're leasing it, what happens right now to our pressure? We probably sell it or dismantle it and get rid of it. If somebody walks out of a lease and if we don't have somebody ready to step in, then the farmers don't have any bank. And it's going to be substantially expensive or take some time to get ag land there. Taxpayers really gain little. From this uh, lease option, liability is still a concern. And, and again, we talk about people who may want to lease, but we really don't have people that are going to come ready to lease it for a long period of time. Do I have any more slides? So that's what I think. I can pass out that last page a little bit in case you couldn't read any of it. Are there any questions about this? I got a couple, Chair. All right, Vince. Um, so the CUP, then if we sell the property, and the CUP has this egg line, if this individual sells it or sells it to another company or whatever, the CUP will follow sales, future sales, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the concerns I have is just, and, and it's not, you know, again, I say things and it seems like people take them personal sometimes, but we haven't done a good job on monitoring our CUPs. We have a CUP on a horse farm out of town that still operates, you know, big problems. We have a CUP we recently just done for an automobile dealership in the county, got all kinds of conditions on it. As far as I'm aware, no enforcement. So I've never really seen the county enforce our CUPs. I've never, in the six years I've been here, I haven't heard of one CUP coming back before legal or committee saying, hey, they're not following the CUP. So that's my only concern is we got egg people saying, I mean, how do we know there's egg lime on the ground? We can say we got it. We can say we're going to do it. I just like a little explanation on and and have it on record. Um, the farmer calls up and says, "Hey, I can tell you right now, this just like this year, they're going to be out of line." Okay. Next week, yep, they run out of line. So then, what happens? We put right in the deed restriction. The, the, the CUP and uh, as just one of the remedies, the primary remedy, the, the, you know, the biggest one to revoke their ability to continue operations. But there's also um, the option of having a legal action to force them to produce ag lime. So they're all listed in the deed restriction. My hope, of course, is that we never have to address it because they'll, they'll comply with what they said that they would do. But I do think that, um, I mean, we ha I have dealt with the revocation of permits through zoning and gone through the legal process. And if there's 
you know, the new position in zoning that is supposed to be in part sort of that enforcement arm. Um, and again, when you have an uprising of citizen complaints, for example, a particular place on Balsam Way, you know, that's going to make sure that Bob's division zoning and my office, you know, puts our attention on it to determine whether or not action needs to be taken. Yeah, well, I guess I know that's the way it goes. I would just like to make sure we it's clear if we're going to move forward with the CUP, and I, I do support a CUP. It's way cleaner than someone having to call an attorney to decide what kind of uh, covenants and all that kind of stuff. To have a guy call up and say, hey, I can tell you they're going to be out of line. Yeah, I know you can have all this writing in the book and have all this legal, you know, jargon. And it's not up, it's not up to the attorney, you know. I'm just curious, are they gonna, so if they're, if they're out of line, who do they call? So if we know they're running out of line, do they call Bob? Yeah. Then you call Dean, because the, that's the condition. Who? Who do they call? Dean, who oversees non-metallic mining permit. Dean Christensen? Okay, so, so they'll call the county, they'll talk to, Someone that is regulating the mines in the county or the quarries, and that person is going to then do what? Pull the permit. Pull it right there on the spot. So there's two permits. He's talking about the reclamation permit. I'm which talking is, about the conditional use. Right, but, but they're going to be they're going to reference each other. So the reclamation permit is going to say you need to be in compliance with your CUP. So whether it's Jason's office revoking the CUP. Or, or land and water revoking the non-metallic mine, each of those mechanisms will stop them from the ability to operate. One, one requires a lot more hoops to jump through than the other. Sure. Okay. I have a question. So if I understand correctly from just listening to this discussion, that what triggers uh, rev revocation or something of a, of a CUP would be citizen complaint? Okay, and the CUPs currently are not being reviewed on an annual basis for compliance. We just no, they're, they're very complaint responsive right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a question I have. And just just to bring this up, remember you all added a compliance officer for the first time this year. So we actually are onboarding a compliance officer. Mike trying to you're trying to get in, Mike. What is the process for putting in place a CUP and uh, you know, or proposed wording to look at uh, as to how that would uh, how that would read? And I guess the same question with respect to. Uh, uh, reclamation and how that gets enforced. Uh, when we had some discussion a couple of months ago, uh, we uh, it was my sense that we had more control with a lease uh, than we would with a uh, an outright sale. Uh, uh, I think the main objective here is to make sure that there's an ongoing uh, supply of egg lime coming out at uh, some type of reasonable price uh, from that quarry. And uh, uh, anyway, I'd, I'd like to, to know what the process is and the wording for uh, both uh, on the reclamation and on uh, the sale of egg. The reclamation, uh, when, when this person purchases it, they have to get a permit. And with that, they will do a surety bond that ensures that they will, when they mine a certain amount of it, whatever in that permit, they then reclaim it. So they are on the hook for reclamation. The county has been fortunate. We are in a position where we don't have to do that. But we are responsible if, if uh, at some point, we would have to go back and reclaim all that we have of, uh, affected. Chair, um, well, I'm, 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 just a second, Mike. Just a second. 
But the question on that then, you know, and I read this again and you know it says uh, the limitations can continue. We have a we have a piece of paper here, Mike, that you probably don't have, but there's a uh, we just got handed out a declaration of restrictions for the lime quarry. But you know, just quickly scanning this, the limitations continue until the property becomes ripe for reclamation. And you know, here's a good example again on why I think we need to have that ag ad hoc. Because we have attorneys, we have administration, we have people that that aren't in, aren't farmers, right? Putting all this together, which is fine. But I really would like to hear from the farming community, does this feel like this is the right way to do it, right? So have we heard from farmers that have looked at this that said, yeah, all that wording is perfect. I don't, I don't know nothing about lime. And I don't know what that means is the property becomes ripe for reclamation. It says an owner shall continue to maintain and operate the agricultural lime court on the property and shall continue selling and distributing agricultural lime products, including crushed limestone, limestone chalk, whatever that is, for the purpose of application to soil for improvement of crop health production from the property to farmers at a price not to exceed market rate, this limitation continues until the property becomes ripe for reclamation. What does that mean? The mine is no longer, no longer has any product to mine once the mine is exhausted. So it would require continuation of the mine operation as long as there was product there to be mined. But what if the guy says, I'm gonna reclaim it right now and I'm gonna quit and there's still lime there, but he reclaimed it all. And he says, you know what? I'm taking what I want out of here and I'm just going to reclaim the mine. Reading that, it says he can stop producing mine. Right? It, the way it's written is until it is exhausted of, it, of its mineral. Who determines exhaust? Who determines that? When it's exhausted, him? He's like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm done. There's, I, I'm, I'm done doing it. But who's determining exhaust? That. That's what I'm those are the things that I think the farming community would want to. If you continued on with the current pit, the way it's going, you've exhausted the property lines at current depth. Um, unless it did a uh, comprehensive soil boring continually through the product to see how deep the actual the vein goes, if the vein goes deeper or shallower than it does now, or currently be exhausting the property lines at current depth. So, so you're, you're suggesting that this yeah. person would want to do it until he says I'm done and then just sit on it. No, I'm not saying sit on it. He Look, doesn't say he has to sit on it. I'm he, saying yeah, I, he does unless he sells it. I, well, what if he had another purpose? He had to buy on a piece of property, right? And today, hey, roads need lime, agriculture, uh, landscapers need lime, you know, road builders need lime, and the farmers need lime. But someday, let's say lime products dry out, but there's still enough there to make egg line. Or he could go deeper, or he could go farther, and he's like, you know, I need the pit now just as I just need a, I just need a pit for whatever. I need a pit to start bringing soil to. I need to get rid of product. I need to fill this in. I'm, I'm going to develop this land into something else, and I've exhausted what I think is worthwhile to move lime out of here. I'm going to start doing reclamation. To me, this says that he could start doing reclamation. And he could c close the pit. Okay. Just so you know, reclamation today would be costing the millions of dollars. Well, I understand that. I just, you know, it seems like we always get caught later. And it says, oh, I wish we would have. Currently, we're at the floor. Currently, you're at where it's at. We're, we're at the floor. Yeah, okay. So there's no more line deeper. No, you're running. You're running a blow sand and water table. Okay. Just a thought. I'm just throwing it out. Just that's what people are going to say. But, but some of you have talked with farmers. I know you. All right. I hear from them. And there's pretty com There's a, a level of comfortableness. One hundred percent with the CP. I'm just talking about the wording of it. 
And I'm not talking about, I, I yeah. feel like I've heard. And we, can, we can become more explicit and, and put in, you know, this means until X, Y, and Z. Property line. 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 To exist so that, yeah. yeah, to avoid anybody arguing that it's ambivalent or ambiguous. No, I, I think that's a valid valid point. That's what attorneys argue about is what was the original intent, and we can make it way more explicit, and that's probably a good idea. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Question. I think Mike was trying to get in there. Sure. Mike, you got something, Mike? Well, I, coming back to the first part of my question, I guess we got off on reclamation, but I'll c come back and saying I would like to see a draft of both the sale agreement and the wording of the conditional, which I presume includes the wording of the conditional use permit, to review it before we sign off on it, to know how much the surety bond will be and what, uh, uh, how that amount was determined. Uh, apart from that, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm not aware of the process for how the conditional use permit gets in place. Does it have to be rezoned to have a conditional use permit? No, it does not. And there, what we're doing is creating and transferring the conditional use that I think was put in place in the 90s. And, and we're, we are, by nature of the deed restriction and the sale agreement, amending the conditional use permit to simply add that one additional condition. So it won't need to go to committee because we're not we're not say, offering whether or not this conditional use permit uh, should be offered. It's simply taking the one that was put in place in the 90s, adding this one additional condition, and it's already in the deed restriction, which I think, Vince, did you hand that out? Yeah. Um, and then the, when it comes to the non-metallic mining reclamation surety bond, that is something that happens through land and water. It's the same process that happens with every non-metallic mine uh, in in the county. Uh, so I don't know about, it's not something where this board could say, oh no, we want a bigger bond or, or that's not enough. This is something that that department by, by statutory authority has delegated the obligation to um, issue that as long as they provide the appropriate surety. It's not something that the county board or this committee could force one way or the other. I, I, I may have misunderstood. You said the amount of the surety bond is provided by Wisconsin statute? Uh, determining the amount is delegated to the Land and Water Resources Department. Of the, of the state? Or the who? The um, it, it's a state program administered by the Land and Water Resources Department at the county level. And they have total authority to establish any amount they want? I, I wouldn't say any amount they want. I think it's they have. There's a formula. Yeah. Um, I can bring Dane in to explain it a little bit further. But in a nutshell, there's a formula that's fair and accurate. It's based upon volume. Um, and that's mm -hmm. that's done that analysis as well. And I think it's a standard for everybody. Right. And how many people are open? I'd like to leave it with this. I'd, I'd like to see a draft of the sale contract with the conditional use permit language before we give our final sign off. You can email. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can give that information out. So is, is this. I just have a quick question to clarify. Could you process with go with the sale? And also with a, a listing in either scenario or a sale only. Sale only. Okay. Thank you. Do you are you looking? Do we need this is going this is on the county board agenda? Sure. There is some time sensitivity to it. Not that we got a gun there yet, but we do have a customer that wants to buy. Right. So Mike's things, you know, you could tidy up the Definition. The definition of its property line so that he can't stop mining the property early or not go to the property lines. Because in that situation, let's say someone would close the mine. Right? Let's say he works it for a year and he says, I'm done egg lime, I'm going to reclaim it and 
I'm done. And he's not mining out of it anymore, and he wants to develop the property into something else. What happens to that conditional use? What, what if he stops a year from now? And I know he's not. Sure. In the deed restriction, the only allowable use is to continue the mine, so there would be no other development that could be put there. So it was determined it was exhausted. Yeah. Okay. Do you need a recommendation from this committee, or is this just moving to the board and you're just updating us? I was hoping for a recommendation. Is there more we can get in open session, or do we need in closed session? Do you mean? Yeah, I do have a little more information. Do we need it though to make a recommendation? Do we need that information you're going to give us? Could that just be done at county board? In a closed session? Yeah. Uh, I mean. Because everyone should hear what you have to say in closed session, just not us. If our whole board's well, voting on this. If you're going to make a recommendation, I think you might want to hear. We haven't heard it before? You have, but it's it's spelled out in a more clear and concise way. Sure. All right, so we, we have nothing more for open session. What are we going to close for the lime quarry and for some property near County Road G in Milltown, <coughs> so we don't have to go in and out again. I'll make that motion. Second. All right, we'll have a roll call vote. Aye. 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 Mike? What, what again, sir? Mike? Yes or no? What are we voting on precisely? We're in the closed session. Yes or no, we can close session. We have a majority uh, yeah, to to I'm sorry, I can't, I can't uh, understand it, so I'll have to pass. All right, yeah. Well, we're in closed session. Okay. Yeah, I continue then. One of the points of debate has been, and, and you saw the, the analysis of what's happening. But the one thing that has to be emphasized. Well, I will make the motion uh, once now that we're back in open session that we follow the advice. Is that how I want to word it of the Corporation Council's uh, opinion on how to handle this uh, case? I'm sick of that. All those favor? Aye. 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 So we'll. Uh, because I had heard from the farmers, I will make a recommendation that the uh, sale of the lime quarry, um, along with the conditional use, that there's more defined property line issues. Mike gets to see, you know, we get the contracts and everything, that we make a recommendation to uh, sell the lime quarry with the conditional use as discussed. Second that. All right, I, I think that's the same. I think it's had enough discussion for everyone to make the decision. We will call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very. So it wouldn't be a new record in general government by any means, but it would be maybe for us if we could get a motion to adjourn. No work plan discussion? Oh, uh, we already did that. We did that in open before. Did we? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.